Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our Elastic Live user group. This is where we hope that people that are in and around the Elastic technology, the Elastic stack, Elasticians, technicians, and other issues that I don't know right now, uh, can just sit down, grab a sandwich, and enjoy a, a nice lunch, learning about Elastic, learning about something interesting. And I am one of those people included today. My guest this week is... Uh, my awesome friend, my colleague, my fellow advocate, Ricardo Ferreri. Uh, Ricardo, how you doing? Hey, good, man. Good, good, good. Hope you're doing well as well. And thanks for having me. It's been Absolutely. a pleasure watching so this live show that you've been doing weekly. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to be talking about Go um, and using the Elasticsearch Go client, which is, is still pretty new. But um, before we do that, I, I want to... I want to put you in the hot seat for, for a couple of minutes and ask you a few questions. So tell everybody how you got to Elastic. What, what was that developer journey? With Elastic itself, right, that's a good question. Like um, my, my journey with Elastic started definitely as a consequence of the projects and the use cases that I was working with Kafka even before I joined Elastic. Uh, from time to time, uh, I would work on those use cases where, okay, I have this huge pipe of messages and events coming in, and those messages definitely represent data. So how I'm going to actually transform this huge amount of data into something insightful, right? Um, and most of the places and customers that I've worked with in the past, they kind of, all right, we, we used to use Elastic for kind of a processing and doing the analytics part. So um, that's how I get started, but I've never managed to kind of go deep into Elastic. Uh, I've only actually managed to do this after joining Elastic where I had to learn the technology itself, but that's how I ended up with Elastic. I'm gonna throw shade on you because you're talking about going deep. This, this guy is like the most certified person I know when it comes to the Elastic stack, which, we're probably going to have to bring you on to talk about that process of getting, you know, your elastic certifications and everything. But uh, tell me a little bit more about your experience with Go and what kind of led you to wanting to work in that that language. That's that's an even better question. So uh, it's it's interesting because I know I consider that I know two programming languages. Right, the first one is Java and the other one is Go. Right. I, I definitely know more Java than Go, to be really honest with you. But uh, the reason why I ended up working with Java was because back when I was doing consultancy, I was working with some technologies and products that was entirely written in Java. And by the time I had to that, provide support or to troubleshoot those technologies and products, I always ended up, okay, I, I definitely need to understand more about how the underlying platform works. So that's how I kind of got started with Java and JVMs. And the same process I kind of follow with Go, right? My original intention with Go was not, uh, okay, yeah, Go seems to be a very cool programming language that I'm going to learn as much as I can. No, I, I started to work with some technologies that were written in Go. Uh, you name it, uh, Docker, Kubernetes, uh, Terraform. And there's a lot of, these days, there's a lot of cool technology that has been written and is executed on top of Go. So that's what kind of a trigger me, kind of, a, okay, just like I did with Java, I have to learn Go, at least to not suck too much when I work with those technologies, right? And, and that approach helps, right? I don't consider myself an expert in Go. I know the basics, but um, if you follow their approach, it helps you to understand the platforms and technology that are on top of Go. All right. Well, everybody, you might hear me typing a little bit more because we're on double duty. Uh, my colleague Faith, shout out to Faith, is usually uh, helping out in the chat. Uh, but this week, it's it's just me and Ricardo. We're, we're owning it. But that said, uh, the clicky keyboard and live streams, I, I, I should have thought that through a little bit better. But I want to hear a few things from the chat. If you're yep. using Go now, I want to know why. What was it that brought you to using Go? Tell me uh, tell us as we're going, as we're learning. I personally have, I, I told Ricardo, my knowledge of Go is about the same level of knowledge as my two-year-old and Lego. Um, sure, I could possibly build something with it. It's not going to look pretty. It's going to be a mix match of all of the wrong things. And at the end of the day, you're just going to step on it and be very, 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 very hurt. Um, so... 
I want to know why folks are working with Go and and what they're building with Go. This is this is your opportunity to promote it and let folks know. But also, I got to let people know that if you are interested in learning more about uh, the Elastic Go client that we're going to be working with, if you have questions about how to use it properly. Um, let us know. You can go to discuss.elastic.co, join that forum, ask those questions. There are elasticians and professionals that use Elastic every single day in there. I'm sure someone there will be able to answer those questions. And if you've got something that you're using Elastic with and you're maybe you're using Go, maybe you're using some other language, yep. let us know. Come talk to us, community.elastic.co. We'll be more than happy to jump on and share you know what you're doing. You can sign up for the contributor program. You can join me on a live stream. I'd be happy to have you. But I'm going to let Ricardo take it away from here and explain to me what we're building here at this project. Sure, let's do it. Um, and I'm actually interested to see the answers as well for the people that are building stuff with Go because, um, like, I'm a suspect to say, it, but I'm I'm a huge fan of Go. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see here in my, my background, there's literally a goofer here sitting on top of the light. So that's how much I like Go. At least I learned it to love Go, right? Yeah. And um, all right, so let me explain, uh, before I share my screen, but let me explain what we're going to do here today, right? So I brought you this like end-to-end -end example where the approach I'm going to use is to, the, the, the whole code is already written, right? Um, I spend some time creating something that would be kind of a very interesting for you to digest. But uh, I'm not going to show the whole code at first and at once. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a partial version of the code that is obviously incomplete and it misses a lot of important items. And as we are building the remaining pieces, I will be explaining what the remaining piece of the code is doing. For example, no, yeah, we have this whole data set loaded in memory. Now we need to create a connection with Elasticsearch. How do we do this? And then we're going to have the chance to actually understand the specific details of what you are actually going to do with the code, right? Because here's the thing, right? Here is if, if, if there's anything that everybody that's watching us live right now, or if you are watching re retrospectively, right? Uh, if this, because this is gonna be become a recording, right? Mm -hmm. If there is one thing that you have to understand about both the Go client and whatever client, you name it, Python, Java, Node.js, any programming language, is that in the end of the day, those clients are wrappers on top of REST and HTTP and JSON, right? So no matter what programming language you were using, in, in today we're gonna use Go, but in the end of the day, your client, your application is going to going to establish a HTTP connection with Elasticsearch, and JSON documents are going to be back and forth between the HTTP connection. That's that's what the client does, right? Once you understand this concept, you're going to see that all right, the, the whole programming model, the whole construct that each programming language uses is nothing more than creating intelligent wrappers that does this, right? And you're going to see this clearly on Go because in the end of the day, when, when we start dealing with documents on Elasticsearch, you're going to see that we're going to basically serialize and deserialize those documents into JSON back and forth. That's that's essentially the whole work, right? So keep that in mind when you are learning either the Go client or whatever other programming language client, okay? So with that said, let me start sharing my screen. Um, while you're doing that, sorry, everybody, Jay here, the disembodied voice you're hearing. Um, <laughs> you mentioned something about it being an efficient wrapper. I think that that's the thing that, you know, I often get when people are like, well, why, why should I use the client? Why don't I just, you know, send REST API calls over a connection and just make that happen? And it's like, sure, you, you can do that if you want, but uh, in many ways, using things like the bulk operator, I, I'm not sure if Go has the bulk operator or not. I should have probably did that homework, but I know with some of our other languages, we have like a bulk operator that allows you to index a bunch of objects at one time. And by a bunch, I mean like millions. And when you are doing that type of, you know, work, you have to do it so efficiently that, you know, what happens if there's a disconnect? What happens with retries? What happens with timeouts? What happens with all of these little things? And because you have the client and the client is, is looking for that information, 
one, it can relay that information back to you in a very effective way. Two, uh, using something like the bulk operator, you can actually tell it what you want it to do in those moments. And you don't have to remember like, okay, I need to manage all of these nodes to do one thing and this thing to do the other thing. The bulk operator is doing that for you. It's making sure that you get your data uploaded in the most efficient way possible. Um, and until there's a better way to do it. And then that's when we we say, hey, if you're a contributor, contribute the code. And if you're not a contributor, wait for the update and update your, your client and then you're good to go. But it looks like you've got your uh, your screen ready here. So let's uh, let's take a look at that. Yeah, just one oh, feedback what? from UJ and whoever is watching us. Is the font size okay right now or should I increase a little bit? It looks a little small and I don't know why it keeps pointing to me being the person talking. So I may remove my self from that to force it. There we go. Okay. <laughs> to force it over to you. Um, can... it, is a, it is a little small. Um, that's better. Okay, so in this case, let me increase a bit more. About now. So if someone in the chat, it, it's good for me, but I, I want to be respect. Um, I want to respect yeah. the people in the chat. Let me know if that's if that's not big enough, too big. Uh, whatever people in the chat say, that's what we'll run with. Okay. All right. So meanwhile, let me let me explain what we have here, and then, um, well, actually, let me start by booting up my Elastic instance. Right. So here's the thing: in the code that you are going to have uh, in the, in the end. You're going to see that this code also includes a Docker Compose file, right? So this Docker Compose basically spin up a new Elasticsearch on Kibana instance, right? Varies in a very lightweight fashion. Like, a, So I don't know if I have them running. Probably not. So nope, I don't have it. So first step is to get your Elasticsearch index up and running. So let's do this right now. Uh, okay, so Anderson, it says, great, I can read from my TV. So... Thank you for the feedback, Anderson. Uh, OK, so let me explain what we have here, and then we can go from there. So as you can see here, this is my main function of my Go program. So uh, we are doing some operations here that some of them have been implemented, some of them have been not. Uh, pretty much what have been implemented thus far is the load movies from files. So here in the project, I have this huge file containing I think it's 5,000 movies, right? And each line has a JSON payload, as you can see here. And it essentially what I do, the only part that the code is written so far is the function that loads that file and create this array of movies, right? So if you ask what a movie is, movie is this data structure that has a title, year, running time, release date, has a rating, has a, an array of genres, actors, and directors, right? So Basically, what this code is doing right now uh, is reading the file. Um, I'm creating some Go routines here to concurrently read the file so it doesn't take too long, right? So if we run this code right now, uh, let me pull up the terminal again. If we run this code right now, you're going to see that basically what the code does is to load up this 5,000 movies. That's it, right? Oh, Ricardo, but I can see that there is a function called connect with Elasticsearch. What this function does right now, it does nothing, right? The same go as index the movies as documents. It does nothing. Uh, query movie, it does nothing. So everything is empty right now, and we're going to build those functions as we go, right? So right now, the only thing that's working is the load of the movies, right? And as you can see here, by the time we have the array of movies, I'm, I'm doing some trickery here using the concept of context, right? For, for those, this might not seem so clear for other programmers for other programming languages, but the concept of context in Go is very important, right? Uh, pretty much, if you want to share some request scope data between a bunch of functions and Go routines, you have to put everything into a context, right? Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. So the first step is to retrieve the background context, right? This is the main context as the program starts. And I provide this for the function that loads the, the movies. And in the end, what I'm doing here is to replace in the current context with the, I create a key for those movies, but I am providing this array of moving to the context, right? So that means that the next function is going to have access to this updated version of the current. So I mutate the context in the first execution, right? Uh, and that's what we are going to do right now with this function connect with Elasticsearch, because we're going to receive the context as a parameter, right? 
we have to instantiate the connection with Elasticsearch, and then we have to put this connection in the context so the other functions can have access to. Obviously, right, you can ask me, right, why not using a global variable that holds the connection? You could do this, right? Arguably, this is considerably a bad uh, programming practice, right? But this is debatable. I mean, it's all about simplicity and what whatever works for you. I've chose to use the context to share data between the functions, right? So this is what we're going to be doing right here. Uh, so let's start by understanding what we can do to establish a connection with Elasticsearch using the Go client, right? So my friend Jay will share the link of the uh, GitHub REPL that contains the implementation of this Go client. Well, this is essentially what you have to have or you have to know to start working with the Go client, right? Um, and essentially, what you got to do is to create what we call you have to use this package called Elasticsearch, right? Elasticsearch is a package that is part of this client, right? Uh, search, right? And then you have this functions, either new client or a new default client, right? So I'm gonna use a new client in this case, right? Uh, and we are going to receive a new client and potentially a error as well. And in this new client, what we are going to do is to provide what we call a config, right? Uh, so every time you create a client, you have to provide a configuration. What, is, what is the configuration does? You are going to personalize and customize how the client will be created, right? Remember, everything at the end of the day is going to create an HTTP connection with Elasticsearch. There will be a pool of HTTP connection underneath, right? And but you have to personalize like a, and you do this creating this concept of config. So a config is a struct, as you can see here, right? There's a bunch of parameters that you can provide to this struct. Let me get rid of the terminal right here. Uh, like what, what's gonna be the addresses that you are going to connect with Elasticsearch? And you might ask, why, why an array of addresses? Why not only one address? So remember that when you establish a connection with Elasticsearch cluster, you can use the concept of discovery nodes, which is how Elasticsearch can discover new nodes within the cluster, right? So as a best practice, you're probably gonna use at least more than one, right? For like high availability purposes. In our case, we're going to, how does it connect? We're going to provide only one address, right? Which is going to be these, oh, actually, let me double check if my Elasticsearch is running. Let me curl. Uh, let me cover my Elasticsearch. Yep, yep, it's running. So it's running on the port 9200. So that's fine. In this case, we are going to provide this addresses parameter, right? Which is going to be an array of strings, right? And this array will contain only one endpoint because I have only one node currently running. I want to throw out there. I really like how Go does that array of strings, and then like you define what they are. Like some of the static typing that's involved in that, it like makes sense to my brain, I guess. But uh, yeah, that's okay. I think that that was about to be like my first question of like, how would you even type that? But no, that it was pretty simple. Yeah. So this is I'm I'm defining the array and providing the values already at at once. Yeah. And then as you can see here, uh, so when you call this function new client, you receive a potential new client instance and a potential error, right? As a best practice, you always should test if the error is different than new. And if it is, you're probably gonna want to panic, right? Because uh, if it's new, because there's something wrong with the connection, right? Um, otherwise, what we are going to do here is as I mentioned before, we need to update this context with this new client that we've used it. So that's what we are going to do here, right? So PLDR, what you have to do to create a connection with Elasticsearch. First of all, you have to specify here the package that contains the client implementation. It's that simple, right? Hey, Ricardo, how I get access to this package over here if this is my first time uh, working with Go? Uh, you can run go get minus u, and then you can simply provide the package over here, right? So 
That's, that's how you're going to download a copy of the Go client. These days, because Go supports the concept of modules, you don't have to do this. Uh, I didn't do it uh, in my case over here because in my module that I've created for this code, uh, let me show you the module. You're gonna see here that I already specify that my module require that package as a dependency. So by the time it runs it for the first time, that dependency is going to be downloaded automatically for you and included in your build path, right? So uh, either you can choose do it manually or automatically how I did here, right? Uh, I choose to use best practices. Okay, back to the connection. Where's my connection? All right, there's a bunch of files here. Let me close some of them because otherwise I'm gonna get lost. So right now I have a connection. I've put the connection in the context and I've used this key here, called client key. So this connection will be returned to the context and we are getting that back here, right? So now we have the movies and the, the client connect with Elasticsearch created and within the context. We have everything we need to start indexing the documents, right? So before we move there, let me uh, let me open Kibana here. Let me show you something really important. Uh, if we look to Kibana, and probably I'm going to need to increase a little bit of this screen. I think probably it's going to be better. Uh, since this is a fresh stall of Elasticsearch, uh, as you can see here, there are no indices, right? So we're going to create the indices as we start indexing the documents, right? More of this in a moment. But let's start working with the index movies as documents function, right? So what we need to do here, right? Uh, we need to start retrieving from the context, the movies and the clients, right? So that's what we are going to do here. So as you can see here, since we are retrieving, we are receiving the context as parameter, from the context, we are providing the key from the movies and the key from the client. And then we are retrieving the value that has been associated with that key, like a hash map. Right, or a dictionary if you're coming from the .NET word. Um, and we took care of uh, creating this. This is, for those of you that don't know this, this is a typecasting, right? Because ultimately all the values that are stored in the context are a type interface, which can be anything, right? Think about this like a, it can be anything, any variable, right? But in here, we're going to, we want to be explicit about what type we are dealing with. So that's why we are casting the, the type, okay? So with that said, now we have the indexes. Let's start indexing the documents using a for loop that I'm going to use it here. And I'm going to just pass it here and then explain it, of course. So what we are doing here is essentially we are iterating over the array of movies, right? This notation of looping in, in Go is a little bit different from other programming language, but let me explain what this does, right? So in here, we are retrieving the index of the array, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, until 5,000. And this is the actual element retrieved from the array, right? So this is a very handy way for you to retrieve both values in the same looping exercise, right? And then what, look where, what we are doing here. We are using the client, right? Let me highlight this with my spotlight. We are using the client here and calling the function index, right? And then we are saying, okay, you want to index. What index you are, we're going to use? We're going to use the index called movies, right? Okay, so what's going to be the document that you are going to associate in this movies index? So look at what I'm doing here. I have this document, which is currently, let me show you here. We're having an array of movies, right? So a movie is this struct, right? That contains these fields per se, right? Uh, where's the index? So since we have this instance of this struct, we have this package that is also part of the client package for Go, which is called ES for an Elasticsearch O2, right? And then it has this very handy function called new JSON header, right? Because here's the thing, you cannot provide struct instances to the client. Remember, Elasticsearch only understands JSON documents, right? And everything is passing through an HTTP connection. So what you have to do is to transform, or should I use the word, you have to serialize your struct instance and into a JSON document, which is a JSON header, right? And this is essentially what this uh, function is expecting. If you look to the signature of this function, 
you're going to see that basically what it expects is this JSON router, right? In Austria, Question about that really quick. You're you're defining you're defining the types of objects in that new JSON reader. Um, are you defining for the sake of Go or are you defining for the sake of Elasticsearch or both? Because I know that like Elasticsearch has a couple of like templating or like type guesses to where it can kind of infer what you're wanting to provide it unless you explicitly tell it, I want this to be this type. So I, I see like, you know, string in float, but is that for Golang or is that for Elasticsearch or both? That's a very good question, Jay. So this is neither, right? So this is basically the consequence of my domain model, right? Because in this app, the movie, the title is a string, but actually we're not gonna recreate the index right now and because I wanted to show you something about the consequence of not pre-creating the index without a mapping, right? But you are right, right? So it, it, those like types and names that I put here essentially is going to dictate whatever Elasticsearch we will understand because Elasticsearch will try to kind of uh, intelligently figure it out, the types, right? Based it on this. So right now you're you're in the good track. You, you have a good understanding about what's gonna happen, right? But you, you're going to see that there will be a mistake when I start loading it. And we're going to fix this mistake later. That's the important part. All right. So this is going to create a JSON document, right? Get that part wrong. And then we can optionally, and this is optional, right? If you don't provide the second parameter here, it would work perfectly. But we are intentionally, as we index a document in Elasticsearch, we are providing that document and a respective ID, right? This is kind of a best practice in the uh, like no SQL world because later on, if you know the IDs of a given document, you can retrieve it by key, right? So it is a way for you to perform what we call a lookup, which is, it, this is going to be another example we're gonna build, right? Anyway, right? So we're going to create this and then Elasticsearch, we retrieve as a response. If there are no errors, we're gonna print the response, otherwise we're gonna print the error. Let's run this code and see what happens, right? So let me go to dev tools um, and show you something. If we get the movie count right now and we try to retrieve it, we're gonna get a 404 because the index does not exist, obviously, right? So this is what you expected to happen. So let's run this code and see what happens. So right now we need to, uh, okay. So let's go run Mango. Okay, so I forgot to re-include the Go package to my module. So you can solve this problem by running this Go module tidy. That's going to kind of a transverse all the dependencies that you currently have in your code and then add to the module once again, right? So mm -hmm. my bad, sorry about that. So now we can actually run the code. And then, uh, yeah, and then gonna fail, right? Why? Because live coding. <laughs> live coding is always the best, right? <laughs> oh, because probably our packages are different somehow. Oh yeah. So let me just. I think the uh, the module that I have here is incorrect. Let me just double check here. Oh yeah. So. I have to use the the, la the latest version. Somehow it included this version that I don't want it, right? So let me go to run again. Okay. And uh, let me replace this with this to make it simpler. Speaking and it's, of, of, it's always speaking a hell. Of new versions. Their Elastic 7.14 is now uh, live. Uh, folks that are that love to be on the bleeding edge. Uh, we did get a question from David that just came in. Are you using VS Code? I think that's what that is. Yeah, VS Code. Uh, let me see the question. Um, I'm not looking at it right now. Uh, are it's just, VS are you using code? VS Code? Yeah. Yes. The, the answer is yes. So yeah, the code is executing uh, since it's 5,000 documents, take a while. So it just finished it. 
Uh, and now if we try to run a count on that index movies, you're going to see that, all right, the count is 4,971. Obviously, this is wrong, but this is what I wanted to show, right? But the point is, for the sake of indexing, it works, right? So this is the code that does the indexing, right? So as you can see here, it's not very complicated. Once you have the client, you just need to call the function index. Which index? Here's the document and optionally a document ID, right? And now the $1 million question is, Ricardo, awesome, but why the heck you don't have 5,000 documents here as you're supposed to, right? And here is the thing, right? Here, here is the lesson that I would like to highlight with this exercise. Uh, if you think about the whole purpose of elast using Elasticsearch, right? It's not just to dump data as of any database, right? You're going to use Elasticsearch because you want to effectively and efficiently to search, query, and aggregate data later on eventually, right? And you want to make sure that your database is kind of a prepared to do so, right? That's what, that's what we call a purpose-built database. Elasticsearch is what we call a purpose-built database. Oh, what purpose? Searching, aggregation, analytics, you name it, right? Because of this, right? We've made a very serious mistake of not pre-creating the index before I start using it, right? This is what Jay mentioned a, 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 a couple of minutes ago, right? So he, he mentioned, All right? So I noticed that you get some types defined into your strict. So uh, you're gonna leave Elasticsearch to figure out the types and everything? Yeah, I did. So if we look about, if we retrieve the mapping of the movies, you're gonna see things like, uh, okay, uh, the release date, for example, it has been uh, associated as a date. Good, because indeed the type of value that has been associated is a date. But there are some movies on that file that doesn't have that date. It's null. So what's going to happen during this index exercise is going to fail, right? Uh, we, you couldn't see here because it was too fast, but they're probably going to have some messages fa uh, failing for that indexing part. So... The best practice is, all right, let's start from the, from the beginning. Delete your index. This is crappy index, doesn't suit, suit our purposes. And start using a index mapping that's going to delineate how your data should look like, how your data should be handled, right? This is the best practice, right? Always try to create a mapping for your index. So in this new version, look what we are, we are doing. First of all, the release date. We, yes, is a date, but we are ignoring any data that's more formed. So it's not going to skip, right, the indexing process. So instead of discarding the whole document, it's going to simply ignore that field, which is what we want, right? Do, does that create any issues with, like, if you have a date that's in, that's not properly formatted, though? Do, I mean, does it does it create the potential for those issues to, to rise up? It does. It does. You were right. It does. And that's why... For cases like this, you can optionally either associate an analyzer with that field, or you can specify that your date has to conform a standard uh, like notation, like ISO 86, I forgot the, the number. So you can specify this very intentionally, right? But you're right. In this case, it's going to ignore whatever is not malformed. It's not a proper date. Right. I, I think that's, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, kind of that idea of what happens when you have, you know, if you're just trying to do this on your own, if you're just trying to manually upload this and it's like, OK, well, some of these don't have dates. And then you just say, you know, figure out a way to, that you can just upload it. And instead of 5000, you're dealing with five million or, or you know, 500,000 yeah. or whatever, you know, from that point, you're like, I need to have an easy way to define one what I want to do when something goes wrong, but then also how the system can handle that. Cause I know um, with the bulk operator and like uh, the Ruby and Python clients, like you can say, Hey, just keep, keep trying until, until you crash. Or you can say like, Hey, if there's a problem, just stop, just stop and let me know that you've stopped and we can go from there and fix it. But um, it's interesting that right now it seems like the, the options are, are kind of like elastic search will, take your inference and give it an idea, then you can give it a little bit more information. Um, but I, but it, it is also cool to see that with a single command, you can kind of change how that behaves without having to go in and 
play around with a bunch of configurations that I'm not comfortable playing with. Exactly. And, and the, it, it also interesting because it, it highlights the separation of responsibilities, right? So in here, we're clearly delegating to Elasticsearch to handle those edge cases instead of writing the code out in my end on the app. And uh, by, by the way, we're going to use the Bulk API in a minute. So I'm kind of uh, creating the surprise as we go. But just to, to complete the thought here, so we're going to fix this uh, issue here regarding the date. And I, I went one step further and tr start treating the, uh, for example, the title of the movie. I've looked on that file and I see that there are movies in, in English, right? American movies or British movies, if you will. There are movies from Spanish and there are movies from Brazil as well. So what I did, I've kind of a configured Elasticsearch. All right, so every time people try to search movies, uh, you have to specify analyzer for those languages as well. So uh, that helps in the searching process, right? So. This is what I meant about you have to prepare your data to be searchable, to be aggregatable, right? If you don't just do nothing, right? Obviously, it's going to work just like it would work in a normal case. But in here, we are creating the circumstances that will make the searching experience better, right? So with that said, I'm going to create the index. Now, the index has been created. Obviously, if you run a count on that index, it won't have any any documents. So let's run our code again so we can index those documents. All right. So I can see from the ID that now we currently passed the mark of 1,000, 2,000. I'm looking really hard for any unsuccessfuls. I don't know if I'll see them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the only word that I can see right now. <laughs> so yes. So now we have, let's see how many documents we have in the, in the index. We have now 5,000 documents. So he, he, here's the thing, folks. And now we're, we're playing here. We're talking about movies and documents. This is only for fun and demonstration purposes. But consider this hypothesis. What if you're doing with financial transactions here, right? Losing a transaction might not be acceptable. And that's the type of problem that we see a lot out there. And usually it is a, a very simple fix, which is, all right, you didn't foresee your mapping configuration upfront, right? So this is the type of thing that you can avoid if you consider this as a best practice, right? But all right, the code is working, it's fine. You can see that it's obviously indexing all the documents, but I'm not satisfied. I think this is, um, sorry for the language, but this, this is a crappy code, right? Uh, why is it crappy code? Because it's currently for each invocation is creating a network connection for Elasticsearch and index that document, right? Uh, I, I like to think for performance reasons, you have to treat CPU, memory, disk, and network as a scarce resources. And we are definitely not using that recommendation here in terms of networking, right? So a way to solve this, as my friend Jay highlighted before, is using what we call the bulk API, right? And this is going to solve a lot of problems, but one of them is performance, right? You see that for 5,000 documents, and I have a very beefy machine here, uh, MacBook Pro, 12 processors, latest generation, and still it takes about like five seconds or seven seconds to load that up, right? Using the bulk API, we're gonna like a, it's gonna be a blink of an eye, right? Because it's gonna, gonna be one network connection, all the documents won't gonna be sent once, and it's going to leverage some of the goodies from the GoLang board that I'm going to explain. But first of all, Let's get rid of this crappy code. Well, first of all, actually, let's delete the index, right? One more time. Delete the movies, no more movies. But now we are going to recreate the movies with the proper settings. And if we count, we won't have new, any documents, right? That's what we wanted. Because right now, we are going to get rid of this code over here. We're not going to use this approach anymore. And we are going to use a bulk indexer, right? So let me show you how a bulk indexer works. First of all, remember the ES YouTube package again, it has this built-in function called new bulk indexer, right? It's going to create this data structure over here for you. The only thing you have to, there are a bunch of other parameters you can provide, right? We're not going to explore all of them right now, but the three main important is what is the index? What clients should I use, right? And what is the number of workers? 
I'm going to explain this concept of workers in a minute, right? Hold that thought for a second, right? But you have a bulk indexer right now, right? So, and then once we have a bulk indexer, we can, uh, sorry, I, we can, here we are transversing the movies array one more time, but this time we're actually adding all the documents into that indexer, bulk indexer, right? And here's the interesting part, like, which is part of the bulk API capabilities. For each item that you insert into this, it doesn't necessarily have to be always about indexing, right? You can insert an item that is going to index or update or create or delete, right? So all of this in a bulk will be sent at once to Elasticsearch and Elasticsearch will figure out what operation needs to be performed, but based on this uh, operation over here. So the parameter action is where you inform, all right, for this item, I want to index or, oh no, this item I'm going to remove or delete, right? So that's the beauty of it. Uh, okay, so with index, and then let me just finish this code over here and then I can start explaining it. Okay. One more piece of code that we have here, just for the sake of awesomeness. So. Once we've added all the documents to the bulk indexer that we've created here, we are going to close it. So think about this as a flush, right? So from this point on, nothing else will be executed. Whatever has been added is what's gonna be sent in a once, right? And then optionally, you can read the statistics of this bulk indexer. What, what is this, right? Just like uh, Jay explained it before, the bulk index API, you can send like millions of documents at once, and some of them might fail, some of them might get successfully be indexed, some of them might be pending, right? And then this data structure that holds this statistic, you can read all of this, right? Right now, because I'm confident that's gonna work, I'm only considered that, all right, we're gonna print all the Elasticsearch documents that has been indexed, right? So let me run this code right now so you can see the performance difference, right? First, let me double check the count of this. We have zero documents, good. So let's run this. And then I can go back to the concept of workers that we've seen before. So go, run, and go, enter, right? 5,000 loaded, 5,000 index, that fast, right? And if we count it right now, you're gonna see that, way there is 5,000 documents in Elasticsearch right now. So obviously, way faster than the previous version of the uh, the way we've done before, right? Uh, there's always space for indexing documents the way we've did before, right? For sometimes you have to only document one single document, so that's okay to use the approach that we used it before, which is calling the index function from the client, right? But I prefer to use this version, right? Because here's the thing. Uh, if we look what the bulk API from the Elasticsearch does, specifically, right? It's just like Jay mentioned before, it's going to give you the chance to at once send instead of one, two or three, all the documents that you want to index, delete or update, right? One network connection, one data transmission, and then it's going to be way more efficient, right? But here's the part that is a characteristic of Golang, right? Or at least the Go client implementation for Elasticsearch which is the concept of workers, right? Uh, this is essentially, uh, there's no surprise for, for those of you that are Go developers, workers is the same of Go routines, right? So this is going to create some parallelism in terms of processing, because here's the thing, think about this, uh, this bulk that we've created here as a buffer, right? This is essentially a buffer. And this buffer has some defaults. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think, yeah so, yeah, so the default is going to flush all the data as it reaches five megabytes. So every five megabytes, it flushes, it flushes, it flushes. Or you can specify a flush interval that since we haven't specified, it's using the default, which is 30 seconds, right? So each one that comes first, it will start flushing, right? But it's not going to flush at once. That's the beauty of it because the, the bulk index API implementation from Go create this internal channel, which is the actual buffer, 
And then if you, if you specify a bunch of workers, they're going to work concurrently, right? To give pro more processing power to that buffer, right? So in other words, as more workers you perform here, more, more faster is not a very good word. Like it faster is going to kind of a zero up your buffer, right? Uh, why I've chosen number five here? Because we have 5,000 uh, movies. So I thought, all right, one worker for each 1,000. I think that's a reasonable number. But you can go, you can go crazy with the number of worker rights. Uh, the only thing that you have to understand is that, right, and this is a go length thing, right? Uh, go routines doesn't come for free, right? Every time you instantiate a go routine, this is a file handle that you have to consider from your operating system. So, uh, if you go crazy, like, oh, Ricardo, can I put 1 million workers? Yeah, you can, but you have 1 million file handles in your operating system to be useful and disposable. So that's the kind of a trade-off that you have to think about it, right? But yes, you can specify whatever number of workers you want it here, right? So right now I'm going to pause and before we move on. So let me see if there are any questions that people that are watching us live would like to be answered right now. First of all, did you like it? Put in the comments if you like that approach of both KPIs. Pretty <laughs> awesome, right? Like blink of the eye processing is not too shabby. Yeah, I, I think that I'm always going to be a fan of the bulk operator. Like anytime you use bulk, like I most of most of what we do, I guess, as advocates is like I have my data. I need to make this data available. And I, I think I remember talking with you like when I first when when we were both, you know, first coming to Elastic and working on some of those initial projects, I was like, yep. hey, I have these like 8.5 million records. How do I <laughs> like how do I get all this happening? And I remember the first time I did it, it took like, geez, I think it took like 16 hours because I was doing way too much on the Python side. And then just over time, I got better and better. And then. Um, a friend of ours, Seth Larson, who's going to be on the show later uh, in about a month, um, he he showed me like, why don't you just use bulk? And then it took like 30 seconds. And I was like, I, yep, <laughs> I've learned. We do yeah. have a question from the chat, though, uh, from Anderson. It says, how do you handle failed documents with the bulk API? Good question, Anderson. So here's the thing. Uh, not sure if you're looking to my screen, but you see when I created bulk indexer and I provided this bulk indexer config, right? So if you look to the config, I'm going to go to the uh, declaration here. You can associate a callback function to on error, on flush, on flush end, right? Specifically to your question, you could specify here a on error, right? Callback handler. And that would give you the error, the document that failed for us. It's not about just about indexing. It could be like a failed uh, indexing, a failed deletion, or a failed updating, right? And you could recover from that. You could implement some sort of a retry mechanism, right? So there are some strategies that you can use for this. Obviously, uh, using the bulk API is going to be always a trade-off about consistency versus performance, because uh, what you lose when you use the bulk API, you, you lose the control of this per each document control of errorin, right? But if you kind of a, attach a error handler to this function over here, you can recover from that, right? You can implement your own policy of retries. But I, I feel that most of the time, like simply trying to retry is not very effective because <laughs> here's the thing. Maybe it's failing because Elasticsearch is offline, right? So what is the point of retrying? You're going to retry until Elasticsearch comes back. Yeah, that could work. But uh, sometimes you have to use more intelligent strategies like, uh, okay, this could be like a, how do you call it? A normalization problem, right? Maybe the format or the layout of the data that you want to index is inappropriate. So it's always going to fail because the mapping associated with this index is going to reject that document. So I, I think sometimes you have to create strategies such like a put this into a, in, in Kafka, we have this concept of, I uh, uh, forgot the name of it, right? Come on. DLQ, right? Dead, dead letter Q, which is all the failed documents that can be processed manually later, right? So you could create a strategy of every time you error, you put in a DLQ and then you can reprocess them either manually or automatically. But you have a handle for this. That's that's the that's the answer. 
Let me know, Anderson, if that answers your question. Yeah, just just to throw on to that. And I mean, there, I think that there are, I mean, for those that are just getting comfortable with Elasticsearch, um, one of the strategies that I like to implement is uh, I will usually do a bulk operation on a sample of the data just to make sure that everything is going to run quickly and like immediately and all that stuff. And that allows you to get rid of all the format errors. And then, like you said, having kind of an error queue of just like, okay, if this worked for this first 15, I can expect whatever code that I've done to prepare yes. this data should be accurate. So now I'm going to run that on, you know, the other 9,999,000 that I have. And if you bear with me just one second, I've just noticed that my Thanos Infinite Gauntlet like is turned off. So I'm going to turn on again. <laughs> because... <laughs> For multiple reasons. One, because of course you have an infinity gauntlet, and then because two, if I don't use it, my demos are always going to fail, right? So I mean, it, if you had an infinity gauntlet, why didn't you just snap and then have the data imported immediately? I mean, I feel like that would have been the faster approach. We could, we could, but uh, last time I snap it, uh, I think there was some very serious consequence that I don't want to remember. So I, I would rather stay like in this track if possible <laughs> all right uh anderson just acknowledged that uh explaining his question good so now we have these documents created let's do what we call a lookup right so what we call a lookup is this for those of you that know elastic search you know that you can perform this get operation in the index specify the slash doc and then if you provide the id of the document you can't retrieve that document so I don't know the ordering, but let's see what movie is this. The Time, Travel Time Traveler's Wife. I've never watched this movie, but I know the actor, Eric Bana. I like him. Um, so if you want to do this lookup here with the Go client, it's very easy, right? So, But there is one thing that you have to consider, but still, it's very easy. So let's do this in the example. Uh, so let's go back here to the main function. So there is this function called query movie by document ID, right? So what we are going to do here is, um, so first of all, we have to retrieve the movies and the client from the context. So that's a first, right? And then what we are going to do, let's do this. Since we have the array, we have the representation of the array, or in other words, we, have, we know how much documents we have. Let's create a random ID out of this 5,000, and we're going to look up that uh, specific document, right? So in this case, we are going to do this, uh, which is using this ran function from Go. Uh, we're going to seed it, and then we use this random out of the, the length of the movies minus one, because we cannot look up the 5,000, because conceptually, all the arrays start with zero, right? So. And then we're going to have the document ID, right? So out of the document ID, we are going to do this. That's the beauty of it. Look how simple it is. So basically what we are doing is out of the client, we are calling the operation get, right? Specifying the index. And then here's the ID I'm going to look up. That simple, right? And then we are going to retrieve. This response over here is essentially a wrapper of a JSON document, right? So that, 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 that's the first. If we, uh, if we do this, I'm going to do this only for the sake of demonstration, but this is not we are going to use. But uh, if we call the string function from the response, we're going to dump in the console the payload. So let's, let's run this code and see what happens. Um, go run main. So you see here, we got a 200 HTTP code, and this is essentially what is similar to this. This will be kind of a the, the payload we are getting. So as you can see here, this is a JSON document. And in the Golang world, basically all you have to do right now is to create a data structure or a struct that represents that payload, not necessarily completely, and then you can deserialize 
that JSON into that struct, and then you can start uh, handling the data. So let's do this right now. Uh, and you know what I should do? Uh, let me comment out the part where I index the movie, right? Because we don't need to keep indexing all the time. I think that's a good thing. So yeah, in the lookup, instead of doing this, let's go to our types and let's create a type that represents that represents this, right? This response over here, right? So let's create this get response type here. Where's my Visual Studio Code? Here's my types. And I'm going to put this type here. So as you can see here, I essentially, I'm mapping this struct that I'm, I'm retrieving the index, ID, and version. So I'm basically trying to read what information from it. Uh, yeah, so index, ID, and version. And then we need to, what, the piece of information that actually interests for us is a source, right? This is the actual document that is wrapped in this payload. So we can read the source, and basically we are going to deserialize all of this into this concept of movie, right? So basically we are going to retrieve a movie for us. So that's what we are doing here. And mind that the deserialization in Go is smart enough to, instead of creating a copy of the whole movie, is going to provide us a pointer to a movie, right? So that way you can, instead of uh, spreading that, copying that value for multiple functions that is going to kind of uh, unnecessarily keep copies of the movie all over the place, it will hold the same copy and then you can simply reference uh, throughout many pieces of the code. So this is optional. You don't need to use a pointer here. If you don't specify a pointer, you would create anyway, but it is a best practice for the sake of uh, resource consumption, specifically memory, right? So this is very much like uh, creating a lot of this logic setup. So like one, you can filter out the stuff that you don't need, um, which saves you, you know, yep. Some performance. That's a performance optimization there. On top of that, you know, we're talking about a very small part of an application that could be much larger. I mean, this could be yes. the back end for something like an IMDB or something like that, where you only need to search on certain things or you only need certain types, but you want everything to feel co as consistent as possible. And, and this seems like a good way to do that. Am I am I tracking properly there? No, you you nail you nail exactly. So TLDR, you, you don't have to do this, but if you do it, th that, that's considered a performance optimization, yeah. So this is gonna bring you some value. Uh, so now that we have this type, we've created an instance of that type, right? Uh, so, and then we can use the JSON standard JSON packet from Go, and then we can provide a decoder. So this is the body of the response, the source, right? And we are going to decode into what? we are going to provide a reference to that data structure over here. So basically we are going to flush this into this struct over here. If nothing else is wrong, we can simply read the movie title, right? And then say, yeah, the movie title with this ID is this movie title, right? So once you define the type, look how simple it is to perform the operations on top of the data. So let's run this code uh, and, and I have a comment about this in a minute, but let's run this code so we can check if it's working or not. Go run, man, go. Yeah, so the movie with the ID 2878 is the producer. Never heard it, but let's see if that matches what, what we have in Elasticsearch. Let's run this lookup here. And indeed, yeah, this movie is the producers, right? Uh, the comedy it seems. And uh, if we run again, we're going to come up with another random document ID. So let's see what comes up. Katie Shakey, I've never, let's, let's Oh, that's a classic. This. Come on. You got to know Caddy Shack. Never watching, man. Sorry about that. <laughs> but I, I'll keep you as a cute until I bring a movie that I've watched. Jumping the broom. Nope. nope. There, there's been, come on, there's 5,000 in here. There's yeah. got to be one. Bill. No. I remember Bill. Uh, no, oh, no, Friday the 3rd, yeah, part 7, yes. <laughs> okay. Blood, I remember this one. Okay. I, I remember this one. All right, so cool. So as you can see here, it's working, right? Uh, I have just one comment before we move forward to searches. 
which is uh, always remember to close the responses you get for either uh, lookups or searches that you perform into with the Go client, right? Why? Because uh, the way the is implemented, it creates some internal file handles oh, yeah. to that operation, right? And if you don't properly close your responses after you use them, right? You, you can create as many responses, as many invocations you want, hundreds of millions. That's not a problem, right? As long as you close them, right? If you don't close them, you might run into all of out of file handles. So, so that's a heads up if you are a Go developer and you are using this Go client, right? So always, you can do this like, to always remember as just right after you um, retrieve the response, simply defer to the end of the function, right? This is one of the beauties of Go. You can, uh, instead of putting this in the end of your function, that decide, the type of thing that you're always gonna forget, you can grab it, defer it, and then you're never gonna forget this way. This is a programming practice that you have to, you know, practice. <laughs> All right. Other than this, it's working as expected. Let's move forward. So let me see if we do have any questions uh, right now. No, no questions that I'm noticing um, just okay. yet. Okay. So in this case, let's move forward. Uh, we have two more operations that I would like to show, which is the let's do a search, right? Uh, come on. We're, we're, we're talking about Elasticsearch. We have to come up with a search, right? Uh, a lookup is not a search. Come on. Uh, a lookup is basically, here's the ID. Give me the associated document. This is not necessarily a search, right? A search is more a little bit of more elaborated kind of a retrieval data. So that's what we are going to do right now. Uh, let me just uh, see if the, yeah, the function is here, right? So I've called this function Bass Keanu Action Movies because this is here's the search we are going to implement right now. Let me show you the search, uh, which is this. It's going to be the best action movies from Keanu Reeves between 1995 to 2005, right? So pretty much, let's run this, the search. Let's see what's going to be those movies. So essentially, it's going to be The Matrix, huh, obviously, right? And then the Matrix Reloaded. Yeah, good one. Yeah, pretty much this. Uh, so let's understand the search here. Essentially, we are doing a match search for the name Keanu Reeves, right? So that's the first. And then we're looking for the best action movie. So what, what it means, best action movie. So each movie has this um, rating feud. And I could be wrong, okay? But... As I understood, the rating is something that if you go like above seven or equals or above seven, it's considered a good movie, right? It's kind of a how IMDb qualifies the rating of that. Obviously, this is kind of a debatable because like a uh, rotting uh, tomatoes can be another consideration. The point here for our data set, anything above 7.0 uh, is considered good. So that's what we are going to use to consider the best ones. And then we are actually creating a range filter that we are, all right, the year has to be greater than or equal 1995 or less than or equal 2005. So we are restricting the data sets or documents that we want to see. And also we're looking for the action movies, right? Uh, because Keanu Reeves did some other types of movie as well. Remember uh, Sweet November? Uh, Sweet November, is this? Yeah, I think it is, with Charlize Theron, which is a Romans. So the dude is not necessarily only about action. Um, I like him. The, Keanu Reeves is one of my best actors. So we're looking here for the genres, and we are doing a keyword type of search based on action, right? So that's why, consider all those parameters over here, we came up with this two, which is the Matrix and the Matrix of obviously, Keanu did many other action movies, right? But we are restricting to this period of time over here, right? So we are not considered things like, uh, what, what is the name of that movie that he did that he's crazy about dogs? I, I haven't seen that movie oh, yet. I, I, I have no idea. I mean, you didn't mention Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure or Hardball, which are his like best movies, so... No, or John like, Wick. John Wick is the one about the dog, right? John Wick, yes. Yeah. This is the one that he has a dog and somebody kind of a... 
get rid of his dog and he goes crazy to kill all of them. <laughs> that's the best description of that that's movie I've ever heard. Yeah, that's the <laughs> all right. So, oh, and before we actually move forward, let me, let me give you this heads up. This is a question that Jay, probably you have this question a lot as well about, all right. Yeah. Elasticsearch is all about searching, right? So what is the actual difference between a search and a query, right? Because if you compare to other databases, uh, relational or NoSQL database, you can query data on those. So what, what's the big deal with Elasticsearch? So let me show you and practice what is the actual big deal, right? So take this match that we are doing. Mind that we are using K and R in uh, lowercase, even though, even though the name is uppercase over here in the actual actors, and still, Elasticsearch is able to search, right? However, look at the genres over here, right? The action, if I replace to lowercase and try to search, ooh, no documents has been retrieved. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the main difference between a query and a search is that queries are binary, right? Either you find or you don't find. They're they're projected to be exact, right? It's exact science. Searches is all about relevance, right? You cannot be 100% right, but if you are close, you are going to be able to search anyway. And Elasticsearch provides millions of algorithms and data structures that allows you to create relevance to your searches. And that's the beauty of Elasticsearch, right? That's what stands apart Elasticsearch for all the NoSQL no database. It's not just about querying, right? It does support query, like you can see here, but it also supports search because, you know, Elasticsearch is for search, right? So that's that's why this slogan of Elasticsearch. Uh, so, okay. Now we know what search we're going to do. Let's start talking business, right? And I'm going to do something kind of a rather intentionally here which is it's going to sound a little ugly, the code, right? But as I, as I said before, it's going to be intentional, right? I'm going to fix it later. But I would like to emphasize something. Uh, where's my IDE? Here we go. So here is what you have to do to create your, right? How do I create this, right? This trickery over here, because this is a body, if you think about it, right? This is a body of a payload. Right, remember every everything in Elasticsearch is the HTTP connection, JSON go forth, back and forth, right? So how do I create this body over here? And I'm going to choose to create this body in a very ugly, very inefficient, and very lack of best practices possible, but just to emphasize a point. I think I think that's going to be helpful for you. So. First of all, I need the client, right? Because other, without the client, I cannot send any request to Elasticsearch. And then that query or that body, we are creating using this map data structure, right? Why I've said it earlier, that's ugly. Dude, look at this, right? It's not very intuitive to read or not. Maybe you like this approach and maybe it's just me, but I, I personally, I don't like this approach, right? And I'm going to explain later what approaches you could use, right? But I'm only showing you this approach here because here's the thing. Sometimes you might create some Go programs that would dynamically assemble a search request that you're going to send to Elasticsearch, right? And then if it's going to be dynamic and unpredictable, it's kind of hard to create structs that will represent your actual search request, right? So. A, a way to overcome this limitation is using a map. Because in the end of the day, here, this is what JSON is, right? JSON is not nothing just a bunch of arrays and maps, right, with their respective values. So you can assemble your whole query using this concept of maps, and you can be generic in certain instances. You can be specific in certain instances. The point is I'm going to create this search buffer that I'm going to serialize, I'm going to encode, that search buffer into into that array, right? So this is essentially what we are going. I'm going to send using the client. Okay, I'm going to explain how to overcome this limitation in a minute, right? But for now, just 
consider that you have options like, hey, Ricardo, I don't, have, I don't always have to create a struct that represents my search request, right? Yes, right, because you can use in map, okay? Okay, since we have this, all uh, right, now we have to have a response for it. So let's come up with a data structure that will represent this, right? So this is going to be our response over here. So um, give me a minute, where's my types? Let me get the search response, here you go. Yeah, that's the search response. So in my code, I'm going to create a new type that will represent that response. Where's my types? Here we go. Just like we did the get response, let's create now a search response. So this struct over here basically is mimicking, right? Hits, uh, where's the code? So this is the field hits. And then within a hit, I have a total and a value. So total and a value. And then I have an array of hits, which is more than one, right? This is an array, right? And basically the collection is going to be a movie, right? So this is essentially what I'm doing here. So for those of you that don't know Go, uh, this is what we call uh, anonymous or inline structs. So you don't necessarily have to declare the struct outside to keep referencing on your struct. So the, the advantage is that you minimize a bit of the number of types that you were going to export in a package. The downside is that it sounds a little complicated, although it's kind of acute, right? If you look at very, very close, but very, very closely, right? <laughs> uh, so you have only one struct to be exported. That's the point. Now that we have, right, we can, uh, where's my code? Where are you? Where are you? Here we go. All right, now that we have the code, let's go back to my search and use that search for once. Uh, I'm gonna copy everything at once and then just speed up things. And then I'm gonna pass it. So here's what we did. Let's recap. I created a search buffer that's basically comprised of this horrible map structure over here that I am encoding into that buffer, right? And then here you go. Instead of client.get, now you're going to call client.search. That's important, right? Get and search are different operations. Search is one thing. Get is for lookups, right? And then you are providing the context, which index you're going to use, the body, right? Which is my uh, my actual buffer. If you are, want to keep track of hits, in this case, we, are, we want to. The hits is the equivalent of this, right? We want to keep track of this over here. Like the total, no, not this, sorry. For example, in this case, we return only two documents or we could, we could have millions of documents. I want that number, right? Because I wanna read how many documents has been retrieved on that search, right? So, and I want the JSON payload to come pretty. It doesn't matter for us because it's gonna all uh, runs behind the scenes, but I think it's always a good idea if you are using like a debugging to see the JSON payload in a pretty fashion, right? You can specify this. Point is, Here's the response, deferring the response, as I mentioned before, never forget to do this. And then we are going to deserialize that response into that data structure that we've created earlier, which is the search response, right? And then now we have the search response. I'm going to, okay, do, do I have hits that's greater than zero? In other words, do I have any documents to show? Yes, I do have. So I'm going to, iterate over the, the, the hits. And then I'm going to come up with this whole movie titles array over here. And then I'm gonna print best movies from Keanu Reeves. And then I'm going to simply list all the all that array in a single string because I'm gonna split them using the comma separator, right? So let me run this code to see if it works. So first of all, which movies do the search needs to return? is going to be the matrix and the matrix reloaded. Yes. So two. So let's run the code. Go run. Run main. Yeah. Best action movies from Keanu. The matrix and the matrix reloaded. Right. So those are the movies at, at specifically from that period. Right. 
Sorry, Keanu, if the, you are watching this, <laughs> and then you're probably going to say, dude, man, I have more, way more, more better movies than this. We're talking about 1995 to 2005. Don't forget that. Right. I'm, 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 just, I'm just saying there's, there's probably a couple of bangers in there that are being left out, but that's okay. I, I'll take this as it working. It working. Like, let's, let's, let's do a quick test here. Instead of 2005, let's increase 2015. And let's see what comes out. Oh, you got um, to go a little bit earlier to catch those Bill and Ted's, I think. The Matrix, The Matrix Reloaded. Oh. Well, at least yeah. for the perspective of good action movies, there were only two. So let's decrease this for the rating for five. Wow, Keanu, you are in bad shape. Um, so now, oh, now we have Strict <laughs> You, you adjusted Mnemonic. it too much. Uh, Johnny, Johnny Mnemonic should have been higher, I guess. Good things. Man of Tai Chi. The Matrix. Matrix Reloaded. Matrix Revolution. I, I like this one. <laughs> they're, they're reaching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. uh, well, th this is awesome. This has been cool. Um, one of the things that I want to ask before we wrap up is obviously you've you've been working kind of with this project is there a way that people watching can review this project and kind of follow along and and maybe try it for themselves yes uh glad you brought that up uh so all this code right is already available on a github repository which i'm going to ask you my dear friend jay to share the link right now and so the whole code is fully implemented there Actually, there is even more uh, what I've shown here because not sure if you're going to have more time, Jay, but I would like also to show an aggregation. But if, if we don't have any time, that's okay, right? You can yeah, I, I think we got to start wrapping up. We are we are brushing up to peep the end of people's lunch hour. Okay, all right, no problem. But as I mentioned before, the aggregation example is on the GitHub repo that Jay is going to share right now. And... There's an Easter egg that I've also made available on that GitHub wrapper, which is an example of async search, right? This is an awesome feature available in Elasticsearch, right? They essentially does pretty much what we have seen here in the Keanu Reeves search that we've done. The only difference is you can send the search. Let, let's say, for example, you are running a search that takes time to complete, right? Right now we are talking about 5,000 documents, so it's not that much. It's going to be really fast, right? But in a sync search, you can send a search and then the caller will give back to the client application. So there will be no locking transaction. And then there will be this stateful entity in Elasticsearch that will accumulate the results without the client applications doing something else, right? And then you can periodically search, hey, Elasticsearch, my results are ready. Yeah, here's the ID. Oh, okay, so here's your results. So a sync search gives you that ability, which is pretty awesome. It's on the GitHub example. Make very good use of it. Uh, any questions you might have, please don't be afraid to reach out to Jay. And I'm not, <laughs> I don't want to make part of this. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if, if there are technical questions, I would say reach out to Ricardo. I know he's really active on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, definitely available there. I think that that handle you have there is is the link. That's where you want to go. Uh, if it's a technical question about Go and you ask me, I'm just going to ask him. So uh, I will save you a step and let you just run straight to him. But thank you so much, Ricardo, for, for hanging out, hanging out with the lunch. As always, I want to wrap it up and make sure people have questions after this. If you're watching the VOD, go over to our Discuss channel. Be sure to throw those questions in there. Make sure that people are getting engaged. Uh, you've got elasticians, you've got technicians, and again, you have the other issues out there that I forgot um, that are dying to answer your questions. And then also, I know we had a wonderful question come in uh, that asked about how do I miss, how do I like make sure I'm always available to catch these? Now, they did ask, apart from subscribing, if you're not yet subscribed, do that. That is the best way. That way it automatically comes up when you jump in. Ring the notification bell on there. Give it a thumbs up. Tell YouTube you want to see this content, and they will make sure that you see it, I hope. 
Uh, but if you want to make sure that you're getting these notifications coming to your email, you're getting notified a few weeks in advance, that way you can tell your boss you're going to need to take a little bit longer lunch because you're learning about the elastic stack and the parts that make up of it, then definitely go and check out community.elastic.co. We have local groups all over the world, but we also have our virtual group as well. That's what this is. And from there, we do live streams every Tuesday and we have other events happening throughout the week. I'm actually heading to another event online um, in a couple of hours. So uh, we are always engaging with people where they're at and doing our best to make sure that we have content, whether you're just learning or you've been doing this for a few years or whether you're trying to learn something new, like, I don't know, Golang. So um, again, community.elastic.co, if you want to encourage you know, what the next topics should be, let us know in the comments, let us know in the chat. We're always looking for new topics to talk about. And again, 7.14 just came out. I know there's gonna be a bunch of questions on some of the new features there. But uh, Ricardo, thank you so much for joining us uh, this week. Anything you wanna leave people with before we wrap up? Uh, yes, two things. First of all, thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. And for those of you that are uh, watching us, uh, the recording, uh, I'm glad you found us. And just like I said, try to subscribe to the channel to see the new uh, content that we're going to produce. And the second thing is, Faith, we love you and we miss you today. <laughs> Faith will be back next week and I'll actually be gone. Uh, we're going to have one yeah. of the, we're going to be talking about Ruby next week with Ooh. the maintainer. Uh, Fernando Briano and the wonderful Lisa Jung is going to be filling in for me. Uh, if, if you can deal with me for an hour and a half, you'll love Lisa. She Neither is, will be yeah. she, she's better than the both of us when it comes to this stuff. So 100%. Uh, thank you everyone for hanging out and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.